Welcome, welcome to the Dead Cast. November 2nd, 1980. College student Craig Miller and his fiance Mary Elizabeth Sowers are seen getting into a Oldsmobile at the Arden Fair Shopping Center in Sacramento, California. The two young lovers had been attending a fraternity event and were startled as, when they were leaving, an obviously intoxicated man approached them brandishing a 25 caliber handgun and demanding the two of them get into the car with him. They agree, hoping that by acquiescing to his demands, they will be able to defuse the situation. One of the Craig's fraternity brothers notices them getting into the car and comes over to investigate, leaning inside to ask where they are going. It is then that a young female who is driving the car screams something at the young man before tearing out of the parking lot. He stands there bewildered by the scene before quickly writing down the license plate number. When Craig and Mary had not returned a short time later, Craig's fraternity brother became concerned and contacted the police, passing off the information he had written down. The next day, the lifeless body of Craig Miller was found near Bass Lake in El Dorado County. He had been shot once in the back of the head and then twice more. Armed with the license plate number of the car, the police quickly began searching for their suspects. Gerald Galeo and his wife, Charlene. Hello and welcome once again to the DeathCast. I am your host, best-selling independent author Ian Tott, and I'd like to thank you for joining me this week as we take a look at the crimes of Gerald and Charlene Galego. Before we dive into the case, as always, I have my normal plugs. If you'd like to follow me on social media, you can find me on Twitter at Author Totten. I am on Facebook and Instagram at Ian Totten Author. On Facebook, there is a Deathcast group associated with my author page. If you'd like to help support the production of this show, you can find me on both PayPal and Venmo at Ian Tot, and that's for one-time donations. If you'd like to become a patron of this show, you can find me on Patreon at Ian Totten Author. Uh, also, if you'd really like to help the show, you can go to your favorite uh, podcast app and leave a five-star review. They really do help in the distribution of the show so if you want to leave a five star review would be greatly appreciated you can also find my works on Amazon and Kindle just search for Ian Totten in the search bar there I'm also available at pretty much any bookstore you care to go to just ask them for books by Ian Totten they'll pull them up and tell you whether they have them or need to order them and pretty much any other uh, retail bookstore you can find online, as well as on Audible, where I have one book now, which is The House of Silver Doors, and another one which is slated to come out within the next month or two. That's The Throwaway Girls of Olympia. One other thing before we dive in, I just want to do a quick shout-out to my buddy Kenny K and his wife Courtney. I know they're both big fans of the show, and I just want to say thank you guys for supporting what I do. All right, now that all that's out of the way, get yourself something to drink, sit back, relax in a chair somewhere. I've got my coffee, I've got my cigarettes. Let's go into the crypt. All right, so as you heard in the trailer, the disappearance and murder of... 22-year-old Craig Miller is what brought the Galegos to the police's attention. Now, they didn't have any idea where Miller's 21-year-old fiance Mary Elizabeth Sauer was when they found Craig's body, and they had no idea as to what uh, had happened to Mary Elizabeth. 
And what we do know about this case actually came from Charlene. And I will get to Mary Elizabeth's whereabouts shortly. First, however, I'm going to dive into how the Galegios were captured. See, the Oldsmobile that they were driving the night of the abduction and murders was not their own, but actually belonged to Charlene's parents. And they had borrowed it that evening under the pretenses of going to the movies. And when they returned it to Charlene's parents' house the next day, the police were waiting there for them. And Tr Gerald quickly absconded, and Charlene was left to deal with the police's questions. And from what she told the police, she and her boyfriend had gone to a new movie the night before, and that they'd driven her boyfriend's Red Triumph, which was an obvious lie to the police because the Red Triumph was sitting out in front of her parents' home. Realizing that she'd been caught in this lie, Charlene quickly admitted that the two of them had been drinking heavily the previous night, and she really couldn't remember which car it was that they had taken. The detectives left after talking with her, uh, but they had heavy suspicions uh, that the two were involved in this. After leaving the parents' house, Gerald immediately went into cleanup mode. See, the previous evening, after he had murdered Craig, they had taken Mary Elizabeth back to his apartment and while Charlene sat in the living room watching television, Gerald had raped and beaten the young girl in his bedroom before ordering Charlene to drive them out to the middle of nowhere, at which point he executed her. So Gerald went back to the apartment to clean up quickly. Um, and then he went back to Charlene's parents' house where he questioned her extensively over what the police had asked her, what she thought they knew, that kind of stuff. He was in a bit of a panic because he had not done anything to hide Mary Elizabeth's body. So later that evening, they went out to find where they had left the body, unaware that it had already been discovered. And so with that knowledge, it was no surprise they were unable to find her body. After this, they, two of them went on the run. They first went to Reno and got rid of the Oldsmobile before ball boarding a bus to Salt Lake City. But unbeknownst to the Galegios, uh, Craig's fraternity brother had identified a picture of Gerald that was shown to him saying that it was the man who had been driving the Oldsmobile with Craig and Mary. Now, Charlene's father, Charles Williams, informed police that Charlene's boyfriend, who they knew as Stephen Fell, was in reality Gerald Galagio. Now, using this information, they began looking into... Gerald's background and they found a lot of disturbing things not the least of which was the fact that bullets removed from Craig's body matched those that had been shot into the ceiling of a bar where Gerald had worked the information they found on Gerald was pretty typical for most serial killers although at the time they didn't even know that Gerald was a serial killer Gerald Armand Galegio was born on July 17, 1946. Right from the get-go, Gerald had a troubled upbringing. He never knew his father. At the time of his birth, the elder Galegio, Gerald Arnold, was serving a prison term in San Quentin and upon being paroled would abscond from the state, ending up in Mississippi, 
where in 1954 he would be arrested and charged in the t murders of two police officers going on to be the first person executed in Mississippi's gas chamber. Now, Gerald's mother, who by some accounts was a sex worker, did not inform her son of his father's fate, instead telling him that he had died in some kind of accident. Um, I bring up the fact that she was a sex worker as I've read a couple different accounts where it said that Gerald's hatred and anger towards women stemmed from seeing his mother perform sex acts with her various clientele in the house. And this is pretty common in a lot of different serial killers whose mothers are in that line of work. They see this stuff and it basically gives them a diffused view on women in that they are only exist for one purpose and are basically to be treated as, you know, slaves and punching bags. Gerald's delinquency started at an early age. By the time he was six years old, he already had charges of burglary and sex offenses against him. When he was 12 years old, he was placed on probation for burglary, later being charged with committing lewd and lascivious acts with a six-year-old girl. The story there, apparently, is that he raped his six-year-old neighbor. In 1959, Gerald was placed into a boys' school. In July of 1961, he was paroled, and less than a year after that, he and his half-brother David were arrested for armed robbery and sentenced to the Preston School of Industry in Ione, California. Gerald ended up escaping from the boys' school, although he did turn himself in and was paroled in 1963. He was known as someone with a pretty, you know, bad temper, even as a child, and as he moved into early adolescence, his temper became worse. Although contemporaries did say that he could be quite charming and was seen as something of a ladies' man, which can be seen when he was 16, he ended up marrying his first wife, who was a 21-year-old woman. In April of 64, he and his first wife gave birth to their first child, Krista. The marriage fell apart shortly after this, based largely in part to Gerald's infidelity, as well as his constant demands for sex and his abusive nature towards his life. Somehow, he was able to gain custody of his daughter, who he sent to live with his mother. There are some reports that Gerald sexually abused this child, and this, too, led to the divorce, although I was unable to find anything that was it confirmed this. He wasn't single long, however. Uh, on July 12th of 1966, he married a 24-year-old waitress from West Sacramento. And 26 days after they married, the marriage fell apart. With his wife claiming that Gerald physically abused her on a near constant basis, including chasing her around brandishing large kitchen knives. In 1967, he got married for the third time, this time to a 19-year-old laundry worker who ended up becoming pregnant before their marriage dissolved in less than a month. Again, Gerald's violent mood swings were cited as the reason for this. 1969 was a pretty tumultuous year for Gerald. He ended up getting married in March of that year in Reno to a 19-year-old and she, at two, ended up pregnant before the marriage dissolved in under a month. This wife's family has stated that Gerald had a Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde personality. Um, on October 25th of 1969, he 
he and his half-brother David were arrested again for armed robbery. They had targeted a motel in Vacaville, California, which, if memory serves me right, is in Northern California. After being arrested, the two of them and another inmate ended up escaping from the county jail, only to be recaptured four days later. Gerald was sentenced to five years in prison for his role in the robbery. He was paroled at some point in the early 1970s. Um, on October 5th of 1974, Gerald ended up getting married for the fifth time to wife number three. If you remember, that was the 19-year-old who had worked in the laundry. Uh, she remarried him for some strange reason. Uh, let's see, on December 12th of the next year, that's 1975, he ended up being discharged from parole. And just really quick, you know, we, we're looking back at Gerald's history, you know, all the abusive relationships he has. It kind of speaks to how people who are in abusive relationships get used to being treated that way and that his third wife came back to him again despite knowing what type of individual he was and she would actually stay with him for a few years up until around August of 1977 where she left him citing his infidelities and increasingly erratic and extremely abusive behavior. Now, towards the end of 1977, Gerald met a twice-divorced 21-year-old named Charlene uh, Adele Williams at a poker club in Sacramento. Charlene has been described as a quiet, extremely intelligent woman. Things I have seen on her list her IQ as somewhere in the 160 range. Now, Charlene had fallen into alcohol and drug addiction at a young age, which may explain why she ended up falling for Gerald, as from all accounts, the two of them hit it off almost instantly, and within a month of meeting, Charlene had moved into Gerald's apartment. Uh, and he was able to manipulate Charlene through both coercion and physical violence into bringing another woman into their relationship. This was an 18-year-old, and from what I could find, it seems that things in their relationship were going fairly well until Gerald came home one day and found the 21-year-old Charlene and this 18-year-old girl in bed together. This sent Gerald into a rage, and he ended up beating the two of them severely. One thing of note in their relationship is that according to Charlene, Gerald had extreme difficulty getting and maintaining an erections, and he blamed her for this issue, oftentimes taking out his anger on him with, her fi with his fists. And this is how he was able to convince her to bring another woman into the relationship. But there are other factors that go into his, you know, ED. Um, one of which is, you know, I brought up earlier that there were stories that he had been sexually abusing his daughter. Apparently on his 31st birthday, he took this abuse to another level, uh by sodomizing the young girl as sort of a birthday present to himself. Again, this is from Charlene's account of things, so there's no way to really verify whether or not this actually took place. Also in the month of July, Charlene became pregnant from Gerald. Apparently this was a bit of a bone of contention between the two of them as he did not want any more children and this again led to him abusing her horrifically now on September 11th of 1978 
Gerald, who had been dating Charlene for roughly a year, decided that they needed to change the dynamics of their relationship. Uh, over the course of the previous year, Gerald had been hinting to Charlene that he was he had fantasies of kidnapping and keeping sex slaves. Uh, this was intermingled with the level of abuse he would dish out to her. And eventually, Charlene became receptive to this idea. And this all came to a head again on the 11th of September. The two of them got into their 1973 Dodge van, which seems to be the modus operandi of a lot of duos as far as serial killers go. A lot of them seem to drive around in vans with which they use to abduct people. And they drove around Sacramento. Eventually, Gerald spotted the two girls that he wanted to take at a mall. 17-year-old Rhonda Scheffler and 16-year-old Kippy Vaught. Gerald had Charlene get out of the van and approach the two girls under the pretense of joining her to smoke some weed, which apparently the girls were eager to do. Now, when they got in the van, they were immediately accosted by Gerald, who brandished a 25 caliber gun. He forced them to lie face down before binding their hands together with adhesive tape. Charlene was then ordered to watch the girls as Gerald got back behind the wheel and began driving around looking for a secluded place with which to live out his fantasies. He eventually ended up in Baxter, California, uh, at which point he pulled over to the side of the road and led the two girls from the van, telling Charlene to stay put. Now, she recounted that it was hours later that Gerald returned to, by himself, and upon seeing Charlene, told her, quote-unquote, "'Ask me no questions, and I'll tell you no lies.'" Eventually, he went back into the woods and came back with the two young women where they once again proceeded to drive around. Gerald again pulled the van over and ordered the girls from the vehicle before shooting them dead. Now, this was in a field. Reportedly, after he shot the girls, as he was walking away, he noticed that one of them... Vaught was still moving, at which point he returned and shot her three more times before getting back in the van and leaving. On September 13th of 1978, this is two days later, two migrant farm workers discovered the lifeless bodies of the girls and notified police. Also somewhere around this time, Gerald forced Charlene to have an abortion, driving her to a clinic and instructing her to have the procedure done, thus terminating the pregnancy. Now, a few weeks later, on the 27th of September, Gerald's daughter, Krista, filed charges of incest, sodomy, oral copulation, and unlawful intercourse against him. Uh, I couldn't find anything as to whether or not he was, you know, held in custody or on bail or anything. But I do know that just three days after that, he and Charlene wed before fleeing the state, first going into Nevada before eventually settling in Houston, Texas, where Gerald took on his alias of Stephen Field. This was sometime around December of 1978. Now, they eventually ended up in Reno, Nevada, where on June 24th of 1979, Gerald decided once again that he needed to find some new slaves. So they drove to the Washoe County Fair, 
where Gerald instructed Charlene to go out and find him another victim. She walked around the fair for a while before coming upon 14-year-old Brenda Lynn Judd and 13-year-old Sanda K. Kali. The line that she fed these two particular girls was that she would pay them money if they would go and distribute handbills onto the windshield of the cars in the parking lot. The two young girls naturally agreed and followed her back to the van where Gerald was late waiting. This time he had a 44 caliber pistol on him and he forced the two girls into the back of the van where he bound their wrists and ankles before instructing Charlene to drive. Now, while they drove, Gerald sexually abused and assaulted the young girls before instructing Charlene to drive out into the high desert at which point he forced the girls one at a time out of the van, taking with him a hammer and a shovel as they marched out into the desert. He beat the girls to death with the hammer before throwing their bodies into a deep hole, and the girls' bodies would not be discovered until November of 1999, Sadly for the girls' families who reported their disappearance to the police, initially the police, as they often did during this period of time in America, thought the girls were runaways and did little if nothing at all to help look for them. By September of that year, the two of them had moved back to Sacramento under the alias of Mr. and Mrs. Feel where Gerald eventually got a job as a bartender. And it's known that around this time he began having an affair with a woman by the name of Patty, who eventually became pregnant with his child. On the morning of April 24th, 1980, Gerald woke Charlene up, stating, I want a girl, get up. The two of them drove around for a while before spotting 17-year-old Stacy and Redican and Karen Shipman Twigs coming out of a bookstore. Gerald pulled over and sent Charlene out to talk with the two of them. And Charlene told them both that she had some pot and if they wanted to come and hang out and get high with her, they were more than welcome, to which the two girls readily agreed. Gerald greeted them in the back of the van, this time brandishing a 357 Magnum, and he ordered Charlene to begin driving, while at the same time making the girls undress before sexually abusing them. And you can see that Gerald's mania is beginning to unravel a little here, with the two prior sets of killings, he had instructed uh, the girls to lie face down before binding them. This time, he doesn't even take the step of getting them to lie down, nor does he bind them. He just immediately get undressed before he begins raping them. Also be noted that he didn't wait until nightfall to go out on the prowl you know the urge came on him first thing in the morning it's time to go as with the other killings he had Charlene drive out to a secluded area in Nevada this time however it was not the high desert but woods that he brought them to and he forced the girls one at a time out of the van carrying, again, a hammer and a shovel as he took them out and did away with them. When he was done, however, he forced Charlene out of the van and made her look at the graves, to which she later stated that she believed one of the girls was still moving, uh, something that Gerald claimed was not true, that both girls were well and dead. And I include that little bit of information as there are some accounts of this particular set of murders that are out there that state that the two girls had in fact been buried alive by Gerald, uh, but 
according to Charlene's testimony, this was not, in fact, the case. The following month, in May, Charlene became pregnant again, which, once more, enraged Gerald, who beat her severely. The next month, on the 1st of June, they married for a second time, this time under the aliases of Mr. and Mrs. Stephen Robert Field. Six days later, on June 7th, they were traveling down the highway when they spotted a lone woman hitchhiking. This was 21-year-old Linda Aguilera, who was four months pregnant at the time. They pulled over, offering the young woman a ride, which she readily accepted. Once they were on the road again, however, Gerald pulled out his 357, which he shoved into Linda's face. He had Charlene drive to a secluded area, at which point he repeatedly raped Linda before smashing her over the head with a rock before strangling her with lengths of rope and burying her body in a shallow grave in the sand. A few weeks later, on June 22nd, the German tourists who were walking down a beach discovered Linda's badly decomposing body. When an autopsy was done, it was found that she had not died, in fact, from blunt force trauma, nor from the strangulation. Instead, Linda had apparently come to after her captor had left, and panicked, struggling against the sand that had been placed over her, and she eventually suffocated beneath the sand. Now, July 16, 1980 was the day before Gerald's 34th birthday, and the two of them spent the day drinking at the Sail Inn Bar in West Sacramento. Witnesses stated that Gerald was loud and belligerent that evening, and that the other customers were glad when the couple left. Now, in the early morning hours of the 17th, which is actually Gerald's birthday, 34-year-old Virginia Muchel came out of the bar and was forced into the van by Gerald, who again was brandishing his 357 Magnum. And this one is a little different, obviously, in that they had not gone trolling for victims that evening but also because the victim was known to both of them. And it shows how Gerald's psychosis was really spiraling at this point, in that he would willingly go after someone who he physically knew and could ostensibly be linked back to him. As the Salin Bar was one of Gerald's favorite watering holes, Again breaking his established pattern, rather than driving out to a secluded area, Gerald drove back to their home, where Charlene went inside to watch television as he raped her outside in the van. Afterwards, he forced Charlene to drive them. She drove to Clarksburg, now, apparently, Virginia begged to be put out of her misery, and Gerald obliged her by strangling her while Charlene drove, and they eventually dumped her body in a pond. A few months later, in October, actually the 3rd of October, a fisherman discovered the nude body of Virginia Mochelle in some brush, and it was quickly established that she had died from strangulation. Now, interspersed over these few months, uh, Gerald and Charlene had broken up in September when Gerald's temper had become unbearable and she eventually went to live with her parents. Gerald left town for a short period of time before returning to Sacramento. 
And by November, he had convinced Charlene to see him again. And this is where we came into the case in the beginning of the show, which was November 1st slash November 2nd. They borrowed Charlene's parents' car under the guise of going to see a movie. Now, Charlene would later say that Gerald had told her I've got that feeling again, and she immediately knew what it was that he was talking about. They ended up going to a bar where the two of them proceeded to get heavily intoxicated, and again, Gerald proclaimed his desire to procure another slave. And eventually, Charlene got tired of looking, and she herself said that she was prepared to call it a night when Gerald directed her to pull into the Arden Fair, at which point he was able to procure Craig Miller and Mary Elizabeth Sowers. I've already gone over the murders and how they found the bodies, What happened next, after they had left Sacramento, is that they got rid of the car, ended up going to Salt Lake City, and Charlene called her parents asking for money, which they wired to her. They eventually ended up moving to Denver before winding up in Omaha, Nebraska, where she called her parents again. Now, at this point, it was in the news that the police were looking for Gerald, and Charlene's parents, who were reluctant to send the money to their daughter, knowing that she was with a wanted man, agreed to. What Charlene and Gerald didn't know, however, was that her parents also contacted the FBI, And when Cheryl and Charlene showed up at the Western Union to pick up the wire transfer, the police were waiting to arrest them. Once in custody, uh, Cheryl, through her attorneys, decided to strike a deal with the prosecutors, wherein she would plead guilty to participating in the murders of Craig Miller and Mary Beth Sowers in exchange for her testifying against Gerald. And Charlene ended up getting a sentence of 16 years and 8 months, which was the minimum amount that she could be held for under California law. She also ended up striking a similar deal with Nevada authorities, pleading guilty to the second-degree murder of Karen Twiggs and Stacy Redican and receiving the same sentence. Now, Oregon authorities decided not to pursue charges against the two of them, instead allowing California and Nevada to prosecute. One interesting thing of note is that California tried to withdraw from the plea deal they had made with Charlene, Uh, but in late 1983, a Sacramento County Superior Judge dropped the charges against her in the Miller and Sowers deaths, meaning that she was only charged for the two murders in Nevada. Gerald, for some inexplicable reason, decided to act as his own defense attorney, his first misstep being declining to offer an opening statement. And think of her what you will. Um, You have to admire Charlene for having the strength to get up on the stand and testify at Gerald's trial knowing that he was going to be questioning her. Um, When asked why she went along with the murders and everything else, Charlene admitted that she was terrified of Gerald, that he had threatened both her and her family as well as physically abused her. 
He also controlled all aspects of her life, including, but not limited to, taking every amount of money that she earned. And any time she would turn around and balk at one of his demands, he would tell her that she was not the kind of the girl with heart that he had thought she was. Further, you know, beating on her sense of self-worth and ingraining her to him. Gerald asked a number of absolutely ridiculous questions while she was on the stand, really in an attempt to attack her character. He described her as an alcoholic and drug addict that was a liar, as well as getting her to admit to being involved in lesbian relationships and showing the jury a love letter that she reportedly had written to him while awaiting trial. Towards the end of his questioning, he said, Mrs. Gallego, isn't the bottom line of your deal to blame both these murders on me to save yourself? Cheryl responded with, No, it is not. After this, Gerald put himself on the stand. This allowed prosecutors the opportunity to couch him in numerous lies and inconsistencies and basically prove to the jury that he was a liar. And during his closing arguments, Gerald admitted to taking, quote-unquote, a legal licking before asking the jury to believe him, quote-unquote, on faith, if nothing else. On June 21st, 1983, Gerald Galegio was sentenced to death for the murders of Craig Miller and Mary Beth Sowers. Afterwards, he was brought to trial in Nevada for the murders of Stacy Redican, Karen Twiggs, Brenda Judd, and Sandra Colley. As the bodies of Judd and Colley had yet to be found, the majority of the evidence that the state had was in the Redican and Twiggs murders. Charlene helped the prosecutors by showing them a ball of rope that was in Gerald's car, which matched the rope that was used to bind the hands of Redican and Twiggs. His second trial began on May 23, 1984, in Pershing County, Nevada. This time, however, Gerald decided to let a public defender represent him, but as with the previous trial, they attempted to discredit Charlene's testimony, describing her as an erratic, drunk, and a drug addict with lesbian tendencies who was only trying to save herself. Naturally, Gerald was again sentenced to death. In the years after his convictions, Gerald repeatedly proclaimed his innocence while attempting to appeal the conviction. Charlene Galegio, who had reverted to her maiden name of Charlene Williams, was released from a Nevada prison in July of 1997. She had apparently given birth to the last child she was pregnant with while incarcerated, and Charlene's mother ended up raising the child. Charlene has subsequently gone on and changed her name to something that has not been publicly disclosed. And according to an article in the Sacramento Bee, has dedicated her life to charity work since being released, saying that she is continuously haunted by the things that she saw and was a party to, and that not a day goes by that she is not reminded and tormented by the memories of the murders. Gerald Galagio was moved from L.E. State Prison in Nevada to a medical center in March of 2002, 
he died on July 18, 2002 at the age of 56 from rectal cancer, which has spread to his liver and lungs. According to the medical director, Galagio was a very quiet individual. He was very reasonable about no extra treatment or resuscitation efforts. He made no final statements and had no visitors. Galagio was heavily sedated when he died. So that's the story of Gerald and Charlene Galegio, known as the Sex Slave Killers. A couple small things I am left to wonder about is what Charlene's life would have been like had she not gotten involved with drugs and alcohol at a young age. Uh, because she was a very smart woman, and you see pictures of her. She was not an unattractive woman. Uh, it's pretty obvious that Gerald would eventually have gone on a murderous rampage just based on his character makeup and the crimes he had committed prior to meeting Charlene, but I really do wonder what could have gone differently in her life had she never gotten involved in the things she did. It's just food for thought, I suppose. Well, that is it for the Death Cast this week. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it. Um, if you want to look further into the case of the Galagios, there are numerous books out there written on the two of them, as well as articles that can be found online. They're a pretty fascinating couple, and they're one of the few killer couples in America, and to the best of my knowledge, they're one of only a handful of killer, serial killer couples. And they kind of represent the archetype of serial killer couples, wherein you have the demure, submissive female coupled with the aggressive, abusive male who forces the woman through his escalating acts of violence to participate in his fantasies, which oftentimes start as abductions and rapes before escalating to murder. And I will cover more killer couples in the future, uh, but I figured this would be a great place to start, uh, especially since there's so much evidence showing that Charlene was kind of an unwilling accomplice in the entire thing based on Gerald's history as well as what she admitted on the stand as far as how he controlled and manipulated her. Until next week, my peeps and freaks, be kind to each other, stay safe, and stay morbid. Welcome, welcome to the Dead Cast.